This is From the Ground Up. Asma, welcome to Bloomberg. I've always been fascinated by what drives our business leaders, and I want to know about the journey they've traveled. My guest is a chef and restaurateur, Asma Khan. Named as one of Vogue's 25 most influential women, Asma gave up law to follow her passion for food. She's battled gender bias and racism in the hospitality industry, challenging the macho culture in kitchens. And now she's dealing with the impact of COVID, which has left her without a restaurant. So how does she rebuild when cities are changing and costs are rising? And can she use her power and influence to attract people to an industry which has been seen by some as slow to modernize? What has she learned and what can we learn from her? So Asma, thank you so much for joining us. How did it all start? Do you, do you remember that day where you said, actually, th this is what I'm going to do with my life? It's cooking to empower women. I realized this even before I started studying law. But I'm very Indian. I am also realized that there are these boxes in which people put you. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, my sister was very beautiful. She's still very beautiful. She looks much younger than me, my older sister. So she was the pretty one. I was the ugly, dark, fat, but class smart one. So I had to live this, this role of being smart and doing smart things. So then the smartest thing you could do was to study law. How old were you? Uh, I was 21, 22, and I just didn't want to be left in Cambridge alone because just when I got into study in, in law school at Cambridge, my husband decided he was going to leave and come to London. So I thought, fine, I'm going to follow him and I'm going to apply to King's and study at King's, but I didn't want to live in Cambridge alone. But I, while I was at Cambridge, there was this kind of absolutely you know, transformative moment where there's a war that everyone's forgotten. In Europe, uh, at that time, the seat at Sarajevo had just been lifted, and the students at Cambridge were raising money. And I had, at that time, learned how to make samosas, and really good Pretty samosas. Well. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good So samosas. they came to me, the students, and said, you know, will you sell samosas on the street? We were, they were, you know, raising money on the street. And a gentleman, you know, but had an Arab accent, walked up to me, and he ate the samosa, came back and gave me, at that time, 50 pound notes used to be bigger. I thought he gave me play money. I'd never seen a 50 pound note before. I was still very new to the country. But I went to the desk and I told people he gave me, he gave me play money. But he said something to me. He said, there's an aura about you. You know, may God bless your hands. There's something incredible in your food. You know, you will do something great in your life. And then I discovered that was really a 50 pound note. So I thought, you know, for two samosas, few samosas, this guy gave me 50 pounds, you know, maybe I'm not that bad. But this was my secret, because I had to prove to everyone I was the smart one and do all the things that people expected from me. I was still living that role of what my family, society expected from me. Did you know that you wanted to, to be an entrepreneur, to have restaurants, to make a difference, or? Did you just think, I want to cook? I just wanted to cook. Also, I couldn't even imagine someone like me could have a restaurant. When you looked around in hospitality 10 years ago, everyone was white. And those who were not white, cooking my kind of food, were all people who'd learned in production line kitchens. They never learned from their mothers. If you look at every prominent Indian chef, and I know a lot of them, and this is not me taking a pot shot at them. Maybe I am taking a pot shot at them. But they all learned in culinary school. They learned production line cooking in a hot country. You, you know, first time I saw a freezer, I thought it was somewhere, it was a coffin. Someone was actually freezing bodies in there. You know, huge freezer, I've never seen it. I, this is your, your, the legacy, the legacy of your mother that you wanted? Yes, or, my mother was pivotal in this whole thing. I saw what she'd done. She was never sent to college and she was a grandmother at 32, you know, and it is, my sister had kids very young, and my mother then set up this business, and she was phenomenal, and she would get off at three in the morning. You can't imagine, our culture, so backward, you know, you can't go late at night. She radiated power with a, you know, a humility which was so touching. You knew that she genuinely cared that she wanted to make a difference and do things. She was just incredible. Is she proud of you? What you've yes, achieved? Yes, she's, she what is. What is she most proud? It's hard.
hard to know. I think what she is most proud of is that she knows that I am carrying on her legacy. I will never be able to follow her footsteps. They're too big. But she knows that I have in me everything that she is and was when she ran her business. And I'm continuing the story and I'm taking it far wider. Also, I think there's a part of my mother who will never speak about justice. There are times when she talks about how hard it was to be the dark-skinned middle daughter, which is like the second daughter. But it's always in passing. Mm -hmm. And I don't, it's hard to say this without getting upset, but you know, in our culture, we don't bow. You know, we, even when we pray, you know, this whole thing about you know, no idols, you don't bow. When I gave her the book, she bowed to me. This is something which is so, but you need to be so strong to be able to do that for someone who is you know, more powerful and someone you look up to, and the book is in her name. But this is what she was. This is what, you know, she never is, has seen herself you know, as above people. She sees herself as equal. You know, in this book, I write about the fact that in 1970s, she took, sorry, I'm, I'm ruining all th my lovely no, makeup. No, it's beautiful. But, uh, but you <laughs> know, I, maybe you understand, because yeah. you're Italian, yeah. you know yeah. hierarchy of relationships. Yeah. No, it's something, it's so touching. Like, you, you, you have a beautiful business, and you've gone through COVID, but actually you do this for, for something bigger. No, right? and for, I, for this is, it is for something bigger. For and the sisterhood, almost. It is, it is. I, you know, I realized this when I was very young that I was never free. I could never be free if I could see other women in chains. Yeah. My freedom comes yeah. from breaking their chains. Yeah. And so many women, and you know, incredibly, I realized very quickly, women in the West are not in a better position than women in the East. In Why? the East, in the East is very, thing, oh no, you're a woman, don't do this. Who's your father? Who's your husband? Who's yeah. your business yeah. partner? Who's the man in your life? Here, it is very sly, it's very covert. You know, women openly are paid less. People know that. You know, you hit, you know, when you look at the way that women move up in management, they hit that ceiling. How many boardrooms have women around? I want to know when women are, women are in positions of strength and power, they're not. Is it getting better? No. Is it, was, what was the hardest bit actually of funding your business was it was it the funding was it finding the staff is it no, finding the staff was the easiest bit you know, i have absolutely the most incredible powerful you know this is like the shakti <laughs> female energy and they're you know they're just unafraid you know because the thing which people don't understand you know yes when people are young they're creative they're dynamic they're physically stronger but women when they get older are actually at their most powerful but society doesn't recognize that. You know, like I go back to India and everyone says, you, know, you should dye your hair, you look old. This is my strength because it proves that I have lost and still arise. That I have, I am bloodied with the number of hurdles I hit. And it's not that it didn't hurt, but what drives me and what makes it, you know, this whole idea that I will get up irrespective of what's mm -hmm. happening, is I feel somewhere the breath of the women who are going to come after me, behind me. I'm clearing their path. Yeah. Failure is not an option and I, I will not be defeated. I will not be defeated. I had a really hard time finding the lease for a restaurant after I was effectively evicted from Covent Garden, you know, given a four month notice and told to leave. Uh, it was, and it was a very successful restaurant. Does it make you better, the need to fight, as an entrepreneur? No, actually, I would rather not be fighting. I would rather have an easier ride. So I'm not one of those people who's, you know, this adrenaline <laughs> junkie, you yeah. know, I mortal combat Cut fighting, yeah. oh, no, no. I wish I didn't have to work this hard. I wish I could step back and let it slide and ride, but I don't have that luxury. I don't have that luxury and I hope at some point I do where I can step off 
and not have to get up every day and feel I have to battle. So how do you build the team? Is there an ideal team? Well, I mean, my, my team would like to think that they built me. <laughs> <laughs> They're very, very strong women. And this is not, you know, and I, this is why I wanted to show my team in Netflix, uh, Chef's Table. What shocked me, because when they told me that, you know, we'd love you to, you know, to, to film you, I said, will you show my team? And there was silence on the call. And I was like, you know, why? Not a single chef had asked them to show their team. And actually look at all the episodes, 35 or whatever episodes. They show their partner, they show their investor, they don't show their team. This is the myth of hospitality, that there is this turbulent, creative, Van Gogh kind of creative chef yeah. who is doing this all on his own. For God's sake, not at all. At least eight people touch the plate. And the most important person is the kitchen porter who will wash that plate twice. Your food will not gonna look so beautiful with a smudge of dirt on it. It is impeccable because someone who you are underpaying, who is abused, usually racially abused because most kitchen porters in London are black. And they are the ones who are the backbone. And this is why I'm very unusual. In my kitchen, I get paid the same as the kitchen porter. We're on the same hourly rate. In fact, everyone's on the same hourly rate. We don't have a hierarchy. Do you make a profit? Or do you care about making a profit even? No. And my accountant hates me. Uh, he was <laughs> like, you know, when are you ever going to make money? And I was like, I don't care. I really don't care. And I think that, and you know, it's not that I'm against money. No, I would wish I made money. But some chefs, you know, have, because you have a, such a fancy restaurant where it, it is very hard to make money, will have, you know, a side job, a, a caravan where you sell, yeah. I don't know, tacos. Did that never appeal as a kind no, of No, but I, I am doing other things. I'm yeah. growing up a bit. Yeah. So I'm going to be going into retail. Yeah. And so very ready soon. Ready meals? Ready meals. Okay. And this is driven by the thing that, you know, not everyone can afford to come to my restaurant. Yeah. But because of the rent and the rates and the VAT, it's an expensive meal. So the reason I wanted to have the ready meals, I want them to have food where I have actually curated a menu, where I have checked the recipes. It's being made. It's affordable. You can sit in your house and eat it. As much, so you had COVID where yeah. you've had to, you know, shut down, go to ready meals that always didn't work. People were scared about their health. And now you have rising inflation, energy prices going up, the cost of living crisis. What's it like? And you forgot to add very, very poor uh, politicians and leadership, which is making that things you, that, worse. That you felt weren't supportive enough of the restaurant business? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think that they just don't get it. Uh, this whole idea that you know restaurant staff is unskilled mm -hmm. just look at what happened what brexit did to london hospitality the backbone of london hospitality is italian spanish portuguese french you know hard-working people from europe who came in and worked in hospitality you made their lives hell you made them so miserable of course then COVID happened and they all left there hasn't been. But this is what Brexit. Yeah. So you have you lost staff, your restaurateurs in general have lost staff because of Brexit. Yes, yes. And the thing is, people are asking, you know, you're an Indian restaurant. How does that impact you? And I think, you know, why are you so biased? You know, I, I have people of all nationalities working for me. It's not just all Indian, but it is very difficult. I know for everybody else to recruit. We don't have a problem because no one will leave us. We have massive loyalty and we've got a great team. But for those people who actually now have got rid of their staff and then there's another part of me which says serves you right because when things were good they were underpaid they were exploited they were never valued the toxic environment in kitchens was so horrible one and a half years two years away from this why would anyone want to come back and be abused it is hard to understand how people have underpaid yeah. consistently for so long and this is ironic because I'm kind of a restaurant owner. I think you need to unionize hospitality staff. You need rights. People are all in their little, little cages. I would call them cages in their restaurants, trapped, working hard, 16 hour shifts. All of this kind of horrible trapped environment of being in a hot kitchen. It's not good for anyone's mental health. What's the best piece of advice actually you've ever received or given in, in building a business? Well, okay, the best piece of advice I would give people because I, nobody gave me any advice when I was trying to set up my business, so let me just say what I would tell everybody, is that 
the bottom line should not be money. I know it's painful to hear. It should be how meaningful your business is. Because when things get hard and the storm comes, you need to hold on to that light yeah. in your life. Asma Khan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.